so I have a couple announcements before we start. Uh, so we uh, have midterm exam next week, so it's important for you to know. So it will be um, on Friday at 9.30, the time we usually have lecture. So it will be instead of lecture, and as you probably already read from my announcement, the lecture will be uh, the next day on Saturday to cover what we are going to miss. So uh, I will send you an additional mouse to, about the midterm uh, instructions. So uh, it's going to be in Smart LMS. Uh, that is kind of the main, the main thing. Okay, so again, if you have questions, please ask me. Is that? Let me start. Excuse me. Yes. At what time uh, will we have a lecture on Saturday? Yes, it's going to be quite early at 8 a.m. Moscow time. Okay, and uh, where can we see your announcement? We, I can't find a letter. Mm, I hope, uh, uh, so I sent it using LMS, so it should be sent to your email. Did, did, did you guys got it? Not really. So the, about the problem, so the question I have, how many problems should we expect? So uh, there are going to be uh, about five multiple choice questions. So the test will consist of two types of questions. So multiple choice questions and uh, problems, right? As we usually have at the uh, seminars and homework. So there are going to be two problems. Okay. Okay, I uh, finally uh, found it. It mm -hmm. was just in LMS, so we did not uh, receive it via our mail. You so. don't receive it. Uh, that is too bad because. Uh, no, I had uh, this. What? Could you repeat, please? Uh, I personally received it. At LMS uh, and at the email, it, because. Uh, in the email, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because I think that according to the general uh, <laughs> uh, setup of the system, it should go to the email. But um, mm, yeah, so if there are some problems, I can probably try to investigate that. But it's just uh, something that not really depends on me. Mm, okay. Uh, yeah. Demo version to prepare for our mid exam. So the best thing to prepare is to go again uh, through your seminar questions and through your homework questions. So it will be based on that uh, uh, those uh, materials, those questions. So. Um, so if you kind of feel mm, confident in solving any problem from your seminar or homework, then you are ready. Thank you. Okay, guys. Uh, um, excuse yes. me. Uh, uh, so uh, summing up, uh, we'll have uh, a midterm exam uh, next uh, Friday. So instead of yes. lecture. And we'll have uh, some uh, multiple choice tasks and two uh, problems to solve and maybe to somehow um, make a photo of them and make it into a file and... Yeah, so uh, the problems you're supposed to solve as kind of you do during your homeworks and then you do a photo and submit it into the system there. 
And yes, so uh, the midterm will cover the first three lectures and seminars. So the to, uh, the material from today lecture is already not uh, is not going to be included in the midterm. Okay, so just first three lectures and seminars. Okay, guys, so let's then um, move on to the so let me start. Excuse me. And yes. Uh, one more question before we start. Uh, so uh, it is connected with our previous topic. So mm -hmm. I, I've got a question. So um, in uh, majority voting, uh, why do we generalize the case of uh, voting in one region to other regions? So uh, oh. it is clear how to do it uh, mathematically, but I don't really understand how uh, why can we do that so the question why do we do because we have an assumption that we only need to look at the one region or uh, why do we do that for other so what is exactly the um, reason you does not um, kind of see why we do that uh, uh, so I understand the procedure for uh, one uh, region, but I don't understand why uh, can we uh, say that uh, other regions will uh, stick to the same result? Uh, then you, you need to, uh, so you can just uh, do the same things for the second region without applying the result directly, right? Just uh, start from the very beginning and apply the same logic and understand that if the middle person in the right region choose the decentralization that all the people to his right will choose the decentralization and then check the condition when it's uh, indeed so that the middle person in the right region prefer decentralization over centralization but when you will do that, you will see that it's exactly the same as in the left region. So in order not to kind of do the work twice, right, if uh, we just simply um, see the symmetry between those regions, it's like if we have uh, a different problem, say we looked for a Nash equilibrium uh, when all the people are identical. We don't do this n times, right? We just do once and say like all the people are the same, just it supplies. <laughs> so here is the logic, the same here. So we understand that the other region is basically the same region. It's just they are symmetrically, uh, mirror, mirror symmetry between them, right? So, mm -hmm. and then once we uh, uh, notice this symmetry, we can simply say that this symmetry exists and that the same result will kind of uh, um, the same logic will apply to the other region. So just skip the mathematical stuff. Okay, uh, so in case of uh, three regions, uh, we can check uh, for the left one and yes. uh, Due to the uh, symmetry, the same result will be for the right one. And yes. we uh, basically know that the central one will vote for centralization. Yes. So, mm -hmm. okay, thank yes, you. Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. Okay, guys, then let's move on to the uh, lecture. Uh, I hope you can see the lecture slide. So, uh, Today we move on to the ne next big uh, big uh, chapter. 
So the previous three lectures was about uh, the uh, chapter or the section of the public economics that called public expenditure. It's about how uh, or what programs, so more generally like the public goods uh, and related things, the government spends its money. And today we are going to talk about public finance. This is about um, related to the things that uh, where government uh, obtains their money. So it's about taxes. And so we start from the uh, uh, topic that called uh, tax burden. So uh, uh, as we already discussed, uh, the government uh, raises taxes for two reasons. First is to raise revenue to finance public goods and then to redistribute income among people, right? So it's kind of uh, from the uh, introduction, we kind of know that and we know that current government collects a lot of taxes, a lot of tax revenue and the uh, size or the amount of tax revenues or percent of national income increased a lot over the uh, recent um, hundred years. Right? Uh, so this uh, uh, is said in order to emphasize that it's important to study taxes, right, and uh, how they are designed uh, in the real life and what is the optimal uh, design of the tax system. But uh, we, I mentioned this word tax system. So what is tax system, right? Let us define it more precisely uh, because it's not just tax rate, it's more. It's a set of rules, regulation and procedures that first defines what events or states of the world trigger tax liabilities. This basically uh, means tax basis and tax rates. But also we need to specify uh, who and what entity must remit that tax and when. So this is called remittance rules, right? Because uh, it could be the same tax, but in different tax system, uh, uh, it's might be uh, remitted by different entities. So I will give you examples in uh, probably next slide. So then we also need to specify uh, procedures for ensuring compliance, including information reporting requirements and the consequences, including penalties of not remitting legal liabilities, right? So if there would be no uh, enforcement rule or punishment rules, right, then probably a very little uh, number of people will pay their taxes voluntarily, right? Because we do kind of understand that taxes are later on spent on like important programs like education, uh, pension system and stuff like that, but uh, <laughs> uh, we would not pay taxes voluntarily or at the same amount. Uh, so then the, as a whole system, right, the government need to enforce, but uh, also the enforcement is important because let us assume some people still will pay voluntarily, but then there will be certainly other people that would try to cheat and evade taxes. So this is unfair. So we need to ensure that uh, everybody faced with the same uh, tax uh, liability. So for that, we need to ensure that people uh, uh, pay taxes honestly. Okay, so um, also you might uh, uh, encounter uh, different um, classification of taxes. Uh, taxes usually uh, divide on direct and indirect taxes. So direct taxes uh, are those paid directly to the government by the person on whom it's imposed. 
depending on the country and on the tax system, like different taxes might be uh, in these categories, but usually it's a property tax, corporate tax, and wealth tax. Mm. Uh, 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 the other category Excuse of taxes, is, yes? Uh, how can we translate our corporate tax in Russian? Uh, this is basically uh, mm, I would say profit tax. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, if I would not switch to Russian, that it's profit tax. Налог на фирмы, на на прибыль фирмы. Налог на прибыль фирмы. Thank you. Uh, and um, because corporate tax in U.S., there is a difference be, uh, with, uh, between U.S. Uh, system and Russian system because in Russian, like, uh, yes, <laughs> it would take me too long to kind of go into details, but the corporate tax, it's like usually big firms in the United States, they pay this tax on their profit and uh, uh, in in Russia, um, uh, it's not necessarily big firm. It's like there is also a lot of um, exclusion from uh, who counts as a firm. But um, I think it's more general in Russia in applicability to a firm. Okay. Then indirect taxes, the other group. Uh, it's a tax collected by intermediary, such as a retail store, from the person who bears the ultimate economic burden of the tax, such as a consumer. The main example here is value-added tax, uh, or NDS in Russian, uh, also excise taxes. So uh, you don't see here the uh, Personal like income tax or like personal income tax, because the, uh, in different countries they are different. So in Russia, the personal income tax is usually uh, implemented in such a way that it's uh, an employer. So uh, uh, sends the tax uh, to the government. Uh, so, for example, I don't pay my taxes directly, so the HAC uh, transfer my tax from my wage to the government directly. So, as I know, maybe something changed, but in France, so uh, the people pay their uh, um, income taxes directly to the government. There is an uh, information reporting system that the firm uh, provide information to the government about how much taxes the person should pay, but the uh, final payment is made by a person. So you see that there is a difference between the countries of how the system works exactly. Okay, uh, one important uh, tax is a commodity tax. So uh, in Syria, this is tax on commodities, right? And it's levies on transaction in evolving the purchases of goods. In practice, uh, there are a lot of different names and features that uh, um, mm -hmm. applies to this tax. For example, sales tax uh, and users uh, use tax. Uh, they are used in US. So sales tax levied on the sale of a goods to its final end user and collected by the seller. Use tax is a tax on goods and services is paid directly by consumer to the government. Right? Uh, in Russia and in most of the other country, the com commodity tax is implemented so implemented as a valuated tax, which is tax discharge on all sales, which is final and intermediate, and applies uh, and um, applies only on the value added, 
which is the difference between the price paid by the first purchaser and the price paid by each subsequent purchaser on the same IT. Uh, so it's fine uh, kind of in series basically the same taxes but in practice the procedure how the tax is implemented is crucial and very important uh, because uh, of uh, uh, the consequences that they it's provide for people to be able to evade it or not. Also, excise taxes is commodity taxes, and it's applied to a narrow range of products such as gasoline or alcohol, and usually imposed on the producer or wholesaler rather than the retailer. So uh, today uh, uh, we will focus on the uh, commodity taxes, uh, but from what perspective? Uh, what we are interested as, a as an economist is what happens when a tax is introduced to charge? Oh, that's a change of charge. So uh, what's better for us is that taxes distort agent decisions. For example, commodity taxes, they change market prices and modify incentives. Income taxes, that we will talk about them later on in the next lecture. Income taxes affect after-tax wages and discourage labor supply. International corporate taxes, they alter the attractiveness of location, meaning countries, for investments. And uh, because uh, taxes distort or change uh, tax based decision, uh, they uh, usually create inefficiency. But there is one interesting tax uh, that is uh, unique, right? So it's called lump sum tax. And uh, lump sum taxes, it's such a taxes uh, which do not depend on the economic value of tax, tax pay or tax good. One like, uh, example of lump sum tax could be uh, if government says everybody with a brown eye will pay 500 rubles to the government, then such a tax would be a lump sum tax. Uh, that is a tax uh, that designed that consumer cannot affect the size of the tax by changing his or her behavior. For example, in our examples, working less hard uh, would not affect the size of the tax. And uh, what is uh, is Fascinating or important about this tax is that, is that this lump sum tax does not cause any distortions, right? Because by design, it's uh, such that people cannot affect it, right? The size of the tax. Then uh, this means that uh, when it's applied, people would not uh, change their behavior, because no matter what they do, they would not uh, change their tax, right? And uh, therefore, lump sum tax does not cause any distortion. So this is kind of uh, unique taxes, but um, as uh, you can uh, probably um, uh, notice from the example, such a tax uh, is kind of theoretical tax, tax, tax sorry. Uh, uh, in practice, uh, there are only distortional taxes. Lump sum tax exists only in theory. But it's very important for us to kind of have this benchmark, uh, then later on to compare all other taxes to that ideal lump sum tax.
let's us go back to the commodity taxes and uh, discuss uh, more in more details why commodity taxes introduce distortions. So they in, uh, impose uh, an imposition of a tax would drive the price on a good, right? And this drives uh, the wage or the difference between the price producer receive and the price consumer pay. And this creates uh, a behavioral uh, uh, change uh, from the consumer. Specifically, we know that there are income and substitution effect in the consumer demand when a of a price uh, change, and this leads to an efficiency and reduces the attainable level of welfare compared to what could be achieved using lump sum taxes. Um, so there is a question probably. Uh, So there is a question. Uh, in Germany, all the people uh, are assigned to a residence must pay a fixed price for a public TV. Is that a lump sum tax? It uh, sounds like something uh, meant to be uh, a lump sum tax, but I'm pretty sure there are a lot of people who evade the TV uh, fees. So um, uh, we need to go uh, into more details and rules the uh, who uh, and uh, uh, when and how this uh, uh, tax on TV is organized. So to understand what are the uh, ways uh, people have to evade that, but. Uh, I think I saw a paper that uh, investigated something um, a very like uh, similar uh, issue, like people uh, evading paying the fee for TV or something like that. So, uh, hope, hope this short answer give you some. Um, clarification on this question. Okay, so uh, the reasonable question that we are interested in is how could we measure the distortions? Uh, so Uh, to measure the distortion, the economist introduced a uh, concept uh, that called efficiency cost or sometimes deadweight cost. And it shows the effect of policy on what we call the size of the pie. So basically uh, what people and government have and how this, the size of the government, uh, size of the pie uh, uh, changes or shrinks when people transfer money to the government. Uh, for example, to generate one dollar of tax revenue to the government will have people uh, uh, falls by more than one dollar because of uh, 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 tax distortions. Uh, so, and to understand how to implement policies that minimize this efficiency cost, we need to uh, uh, have an analysis of how to measure efficiency cost of a given tax system, right? So what, this is what we are going to do uh, to uh, dig to learn uh, how to measure efficiency cost. And one important uh, note here is uh, efficiency cost mean basically the same that debt weight loss and the same that access burden. So this is three terms that mean the same, but uh, depending on the context or on the um, uh, kind of uh, part of the public finance, different terms are used. This is kind of historically, uh, probably, or by 
people preferences. So uh, the, we start from the simplest uh, analysis of access burden, and it's based on the concept of Marshall and surplus. You're probably already familiar with that idea, but we just will refresh that. So we will assume that there are two goods, X and Y. Good Y is untaxed numerator, so it's priced to one. And good X uh, uh, is uh, a good that's subject to tax at rate T. The quantity of good X falls from X0 to X1 as tax is introduced, right? So an introduction of tax uh, reduces the quantity of good X. And for simplicity, we now assume that a supply is flat, which kind of presume that uh, we have uh, constant return to scale. Oh, the other way to say this is the producer price is fixed at P0. And then the position of tax would arise the tax from uh, P0 to P1, which is just P0 plus T. There is a, a figure that illustrate the story. So, we have uh, the, the demand uh, curve uh, indicated by letter D, and then the initial supply uh, curve uh, corresponds to the flat line at P0, and then an introduction of the tax moves up the supply, and it's now uh, goes at P1. So. Uh, what happens to a consumer surplus, right? First of all, uh, the uh, equilibrium moves from point zero to point one, and as a result, uh, the consumer surplus uh, changes, right? Uh, uh, to what? To the area that here is uh, denoted by letter A plus B, right? This. Uh, rectangular plus a triangular. Uh, but uh, uh, what uh, is uh, the tax that the government collect? Uh, it's represented on this figure by area A, right? So why? Because the, uh, it's equal to the tax multiplied the uh, quantity of good, quantity of good is X1, so it's widths uh, uh, of this rectangular, right, and at the heights of this uh, uh, rectangular is uh, uh, difference between P1 and P0. So then what is P? Area B here is uh, loss, right, uh, in the consumer surplus, and it's called the dead weight loss, right. And uh, uh, in public economics, it's usually also called just harbor chunk, right. And uh, this Heiberger triangle is a measure uh, of uh, a dead weight loss uh, due to uh, introduction of a tax on a good. Okay, so we Excuse can. Me. Uh, yes. And on the previous graph, uh, consumer surplus uh, finally uh, should be the figure um, up. Uh, to eight? Yeah, yeah, probably. Mm, to eight. Uh, so I, I meant the change in a consumer surplus, right? When I say area A plus B, but yes, the consumer surplus is uh, uh, the mm, mm, area uh, to the left of the demand curve and up of the supply curve, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the question. So then, uh, 
let us uh, um, derive the deadweight laws uh, mathematically. So it's a simple uh, derivation. So let's consider the introduction of a small tax. So because it's small, we will denote it by dt, emphasize that it's like a very small uh, change in the tax rate. Then the area of harbor by triangle is equal to the uh, area of a triangle, right? So it's uh, one half of uh, dt multiplied dx and minus here uh, is uh, to compensate for the fact that dx is negative. Right? So because an increase in tax causes a reduction in the quantity. So uh, this is uh, the formula that we can use. Or we can instead uh, uh, write this formula using elasticities. So specifically, we need to recall what is elasticity of demand. Uh, epsilon D is equal to the percentage change uh, in the quantity as a, a result of 1% uh, uh, change in the price, right? So the mathematical it's mean uh, uh, P divided by X right, uh, multiply the derivative of dx with respect to dp. Uh, remembering that uh, in this case, uh, when the supply is flat, we have that uh, dp is equal to dt, and therefore uh, from the uh, formula for the elasticity, we can derive uh, dx, which is equal to epsilon d, uh, multiply uh, uh, x0 divided by p0 multiply dt. So here, 0 emphasize the, the initial point, right? So the um, our calculation applies to this initial point. And then we can, um, uh, we can finally rewrite uh, the formula for dead weight loss. So it's minus one half epsilon d multiply x zero divided by p zero and multiply dt squared. Okay, so it's just uh, mm, uh, uh, also the formula for dead weight loss by uh, using the notion of elasticity. Excuse me. Oh yes. I've got a question. Uh, uh, so, uh, our uh, DVL, uh, is it calculated um, below zero, or it is calculated as a um, square, so it should be positive or not? Yes, it's positive, but uh, remember that uh, elasticity, as it's defined on my slide, is negative. Right, so mm. uh, and so minus. Given that elasticity is negative, will eventually give us that the dead weight loss is positive. Okay, thank you. So yes, when you apply it, you either kind of do as I did, right, or if you want, you may apply the absolute value of the uh, elasticity, right. Uh, and then you don't need the uh, minus here. Okay, so a uh, couple implications that we can uh, make from uh, those formulas. First of all, we see that access burden, right, or dead weight loss increases with the square of tax rate. And uh, the second is that we see that access burden increases with elasticity. And from those, we can immediately say that with uh, many good, the most efficient way to raise tax revenue would be uh, to spread taxes across all goods to keep tax rates relatively low on all goods, and also to tax inelastic goods more. 
right, there is a potential concern about that uh, first bullet here. Uh, I wouldn't talk much about it. I'm just like <laughs> confirming that yes, there is a potential concern, and you probably already discussed this in your other courses, but we'll talk about it later. Okay. Uh, this is, uh, we just learned the uh, uh, formula for the dead weight loss uh, uh, based on the Marshall and consumer surplus. It's, it's nice, it's simple, like it's, it's uh, have a nice graphical uh, visual um, illustration. But there are some problems with that. Specifically, uh, one problem is past dependent of consumer surplus with taxes on multiple goods. Uh, what does it mean? It means if we consider a change uh, in a tax from uh, some initial level to some uh, uh, eventual level, let's call it T0 and T1. And one way is just to conduct tax reform uh, immediately, right? Just like one, just uh, one jump from one tax rate to another. The other way is to conduct the tax reform uh, in a steps, right? Say those to make it. Uh, hmm, uh, that people experience uh, not that uh, sudden change in the tax rate or something like that. Say to change, uh, uh, make a change not uh, from T0 to T1, but uh, through some intermediate level of T tilde, let's call it. Then if we calculate the change in the consumer surplus from T0 to, to T tilde, plus a change in the consumer surplus from T tilde to T1, that it would not be equal to a change in a consumer surplus from T0 to T1. Uh, so this is something that we don't really like, all right, because we kind of uh, hope that uh, the uh, that ray law should depend on the initial and the final uh, state of the world. Uh, but uh, there is also another problem with the consumer surplus, uh, with the Marshallian consumer surplus, is that it's not derived from utility of welfare function, and hence there is no well-defined economic question to which Marshall and measure factors were is the answer. We will now uh, try to kind of uh, uh, deal with those problems, but uh, uh, by uh, introducing another measures of uh, dead weight loss. And to do that, we need uh, kind of the idea is we need units to measure utility loss. Excuse me. Yes. Uh, before moving uh, forward, uh, can you please, uh, in short, illustrate uh, the first problem with uh, Marshallian measure? So it uh, it uh, seems okay and clear mathematically, but, but I can't imagine it on the graph. So why does it happen? Yeah, so the thing is that it's with the multiple goods. With taxes and multiple goods. When we are uh, we have in our graph, right? We usually have a tax just on one. Like we have just two goods with a tax on one good. This uh, if the story is like that, then there is no problem with the uh, consumer surplus. But if the story is much more complicated, we have like uh, mm, multiple goods and multiple taxes and uh, consider a change, uh, then there, there might be a potential problem like that. Okay. So, uh, but, yes, yeah, so... <laughs> um, so, the situation 
is not uh, so pretty in any measured uh, areas, right? Yes. Okay, thank you. Mm, uh, to uh, uh, deal with that, we will use expenditure function to translate the utility loss into dollars or money metrics. So expenditure function, expenditure function, what is that? <laughs> Uh, I do hope that you uh, learned it uh, at your microeconomics course. Uh, let us just uh, kind of dig in our brains and recall it. So uh, we will uh, need to recall Hixian consumer uh, surplus uh, or Hixian, uh, first of all, Hixian demand, right? and then uh, Hixian consumer surplus and use it to measure excess burden. So uh, we will need to recall two monetary measures of welfare loss from price chase that are called compensated variation and equivalent variation. Right? And then once we kind of recall what is that, then to construct access burden would be a simple task because it would be just a difference between, say, uh, compensated variation and uh, minus taxes paid by a consumer. Okay. So our task now is to recall what is compensated variation and then later what is equivalent variation. Compensating variation is the amount of money that an agent must be compensated in order to keep his utility at X ante level. So here uh, is the key is that uh, we want uh, to uh, uh, kind of uh, Uh, make a transfer or like uh, uh, make a change in a price or introduction of a tax in such a way that utility of a consumer will uh, fix at X ante level. Right? So uh, using then the expenditure function, we can write the formula for CV as a difference uh, between the expenditure function, here denoted by E, uh, evaluated at uh, prices P1 uh, and utility level U0. So the expenditure P1 U0 is basically means how much money is needed to a consumer in order to achieve utility level U0 when price prices are P1. And uh, then we need to subtract uh, expenditures mm, uh, at prices P0 and utility U0. If we simply looked at this difference, then uh, we can rewrite this as an integral, right? An integral from the derivative of uh, expenditure function, DEDP, uh, when uh, uh, we integrate from P0 to P1. This is just a mathematical uh, 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 what? formula, right? But then we need to recall a, a problem, uh, sorry, a property from uh, of an expenditure function. Here I will mm, tell you it. So the derivative of the expenditure function with respect to price is equal to uh, Hicksian or sometimes we call it compensated demand, which is here denoted by Xc. Right, so, and then we are ready to um, uh, 
can uh, to uh, finish our formula for the CV. So it's an in integral from P0 to P1 of the compensated demand uh, of DP uh, U0. Right? It's compensated demand that corresponds to utility level U0. And uh, just to refresh uh, uh, what is uh, behind this formula is that how much uh, what is compensated variation is how much compensations are needed to reach the original utility level at new prices. Uh, okay, we could go to a graph, but probably we will uh, talk to in a similar way about equivalent variation, and then go to a graphical illustration of uh, CV and EV uh, together, right? So uh, what is equivalent variation? It's kind of similar, but we assume that tax is already in place and then remove it. Then equivalent variation shows the amount of money that can be taken from agent to leave him with uh, same ex post utility. Here we kind of want to uh, fix the uh, uh, utility uh, of a consumer at uh, ex post utility level. But uh, then uh, the expenditure function can be expressed as a different, uh, sorry, the equivalent variation can be expressed as the uh, difference between uh, the expenditure function E evaluated at P1 U1 and uh, expenditure function E evaluated at P0 utility U1. So again, let me uh, say E P1 U1 basically means how much money, right, the income that is needed to a consumer to, re to have utility level U1 when price is P1, right? This is the meaning of this, the expenditure function. Again, we just simply imply the uh, diff uh, mm, uh, the uh, formula uh, from the definition of the integral and we write the difference in this expenditure function as an integral uh, of the derivative of DDP uh, when we integrate from P0 to P1. And then using the property of expenditure function, that the derivative of the expenditure function with respect to price is equal to the uh, compensated demand or fixing demand. Uh, here it's xc of p u1 and then integrate it from p0 p1. And then once we calculate this number, we will know how much money uh, an agent is willing to pay to avoid taxes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I promised you a graph, it will be in uh, one more slide, so before we uh, go there, so let us finally define what is access burden. It's simply the change in a consumer surplus minus tax paid. So, and given that we have two measures, of a uh, change in the uh, Hicksian consumer surplus, we will have two measures of access burden. Uh, first uh, measure of access burden based on the compensated variation and correspondingly equal to CV minus the taxes paid in that story, right, which is P1 minus P0 multiply the compensated demand evaluated at P1 U0, right, this is critical. And the second formula here is 
axis burden, uh, measure of axis burden based on equivalent variation. So correspondingly, it's equal to EV minus taxes paid in that story, which is P1 minus P0 multiply the compensated demand at P1 U1. Okay, let's just go to a graph. So uh, this is uh, the graph we had before uh, with uh, uh, two additional lines. So we have this uh, demand curve, right? And uh, then through point zero, we draw a compensated demand curve that corresponds uh, to the compensated demand at uh, when utility level is U0. Right? Uh, then, right, let us talk about CV. So uh, the price changes, right, we introduce tax and the price changes is from P0 to P1. But we uh, compensate consumers so that uh, uh, he uh, uh, stays at utility level U0. So then uh, the uh, 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 consumption, right? So the demand change from point zero to point uh, one prime, right? So we're moving along of the this compensated demand uh, of uh, U zero. Uh, so then, uh, what is the uh, change in the uh, consumer surplus in this case, right? So what is actually the CV on this graph? So, it's similar to uh, kind of the, uh, what we did in the Marshallian surplus, right? We just, uh, change in the consumer uh, surplus is just uh, the area uh, between P0 and P1 to the uh, left of uh, the compensated demand U0. We also can uh, know, uh, know this from the formula through the integral, uh, the, this integral formula we just derived. Let me go back to it, this one, right? So, but to apply it, we need to recall that in uh, economics, we usually uh, draw graphs not the way we do in mathematics, right? We do that uh, uh, in a way. So in mathematics, the uh, quantity would be the uh, vertical axis and the price would be the horizontal axis and then integral uh, is the area below the graph, right? Because here in economics, we kind of uh, rotate our graph. So then the integral is the area to the uh, left of, uh, of the curve, right? And remember, so when we talked about CV, it's an integral between P0 to P1 uh, of a, a 
compensated uh, demand at level U0, right? So it's uh, then exactly what I just explained to you, right? So don't be confused because uh, mm, I, in the formula, denoted the compensated demand by XC, and here in the graph you see DC. It's exactly the same thing, just the different notation because I just copied the graph from the handbook of uh, public economics, the reference I gave you at the very beginning. Uh, okay, then uh, CV as we already understand, is equal to area A, C plus D. What would the, uh, be the tax paid to the uh, uh, government in this story? Uh, it would be just an area A plus C, right? So, because prices it increases from P0 to P1, and the uh, quantity changes from point 0.0 to the uh, uh, level corresponding to one, one prime, right? And then, what is the access burden, measure of access burden based on compensated variation? It is that triangle uh, uh, denoted here by letter D, right? Uh, that triangle, uh, that, that small triangle. It's certainly smaller than would be when we, if we would use uh, uh, Marshallian surplus to measure the dead weight loss, right? But, uh, okay, we also need to uh, figure out what is uh, equivalent variation and what is the uh, measure of uh, access burden based on the equivalent variation of this on this graph, but it should be easier, right? So with that, let us assume uh, that tax is already in place. So we start from point one and then remove it in a such a way that we fix the utility at level U1. Uh, so to uh, represent that, we need to draw uh, the compensated demand curve through point one, right? It's denoted here by DC of U1. Uh, then uh, the demand will uh, uh, kind of change from uh, the uh, point one to point zero prime, right? And the corresponding change in the uh, Higgs and consumer surplus would be the area. Uh, I would I want to say below, but it's actually to the left, right? Of this uh, compensated demand curve corresponding to utility level U one. Um, from uh, between these two vertical, uh, two horizontal lines P0 and P1, right? So there is no letter for me to call it, right? It's letter A plus this uh, small triangle that doesn't, that is uh, not denoted by any letter. Uh, then uh, what is the tax paid to the government here? Uh, it's area A. And then what is uh, the difference between those 
the EV and Area A, which is taxes paid. It's the uh, measure of access burden based on the uh, equivalent variation, right? The, this triangle between um, um, uh, point one, zero prime, and uh, uh, the uh, gray area A. Okay, I know it's hard to follow my explanation of the graph just listening it. It's much easier if I would draw it, but unfortunately we cannot, we don't have this opportunity. So uh, I hope you got something. So with that, uh, let us uh, move on. And the next that we are going to do is again, uh, draw a graph, right? Uh, it's again to illustrate uh, the uh, access burden measures that we just learned, but in a difficult space, in a different space. So here we were in a space, uh, the price and quantity of the good that is affected by a tax. Here we are going to do something that actually is more familiar to do to you. Uh, we're going to draw uh, to illustrate uh, the um, actually equivalent variation uh, in a commodity space, meaning that uh, on one axis there will be good. So uh, uh, the good Y is on the horizontal axis, it's a numerator commodity, and the good X, which is tax good, is on the vertical axis, right? Uh, and so what we do is we start from point zero, which corresponds to the uh, uh, initial uh, situation where uh, mm, uh, initial budget line is tangent to the uh, initial indifference curve that corresponds to utility level U0. Then uh, tax is introduced, so the price uh, on uh, tax commodity increases. As a result, the budget line uh, rotates and becomes uh, uh, flatter. Uh, then uh, mm, the uh, new uh, uh, solution would be at point one, the new uh, kind of equilibrium. Uh, um, uh, Right, and uh, so to uh, reach uh, this point one, right, at uh, <clears throat> the uh, initial prices, right? So uh, we, uh, sorry guys, I just uh, have difficulty to explain that thing. Uh, so let me talk about this point uh, zero prime. So uh, zero prime corresponds to the point that we are going to uh, obtain, right, uh, uh, the after tax ex post utility level, right, which is uh, utility level U1, if the prices uh, will be zero, right? If the, the prices will be for change, then to do that, we need to draw a parallel line parallel to the initial budget line. Uh, 
such that it is tangent to the uh, indifference curve corresponding to level U1, right? And uh, this is denoted by point uh, zero prime. Then uh, uh, the difference, uh, so everything uh, that we are interested in is uh, measured uh, on the numeric commodity, right? Because numeric commodity is basically measured the income. So uh, if we draw a line parallel to the initial budget line through the uh, point one, uh, then its intersection with the numeric commodity axis uh, gives us point D and the, the difference between the initial uh, income Y, which is uh, actually expenditure of P1, U1, is uh, nothing else but the lump sum uh, mm, Yes, so uh, the revenue uh, collected by the government, right? But the change in the consumer surplus is actually low, right? And it is uh, different between the initial point Y and uh, the intersection of this uh, dashed line that goes through the point uh, zero prime and the numeric commodity which is denoted here by E of P0 U1. Uh, so then the difference between, uh, between point D and this point E uh, P0 U1 is uh, actually the measure of access burden based on equivalent variation. Excuse me, uh, could you please yes. repeat how did we manage uh, to find uh, point one? Point one is just uh, 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 after taxes introduced, right? Uh, the budget line uh, changes, right? It becomes more flatter. And then we, we find uh, the point where the indifference curves would be uh, tangent to the um, hmm, this new budget line, right? So it depends on the on the uh, indifference curves, right? The like hmm? this is something that you did in the microeconomics, right? So yes. uh, you find a point where indifference curve is tangent to the budget line. This is what you do here. You, uh, you have a, bu a budget line and you find a point where indifference curve is just tangent to it. At um, some point, one. Right? Okay, thank you. And uh, what is the difference uh, between uh, E uh, from uh, P0, U1 and R uh, from P0, P1, and U1. So, uh, which of them is the uh, government uh, revenue from the tax? Yes, yeah, the government revenue is this R revenue, right? Uh, and it's the length of this dark interval. Okay. And uh, the uh, E expenditure function of P0 U1 is the difference between the uh, beginning of uh, uh, coordinate and this point, right? Uh, so, okay. Okay. Thank you. And uh, yes. Okay. So, uh, you will work more on, uh, on the graphs like that during the seminar. I don't know how you can do that. Hopefully you would be able to draw something uh, by yourself so to understand it better. Uh, uh, but we are um, 
there's an interesting uh, internet source that you can play this uh, by yourself. And um, yes, I need to mention here to you that uh, uh, the effect of a, a, a introduction of a tax can be broken down into two components, an income effect and the substitution effect. Here I will explain it to you uh, using this graph for the uh, equivalent variation, right? But rem uh, know that in your microeconomics course, you usually uh, uh, do this uh, based on the uh, graph for the compensated variation. And this is more classical way to do that, right? To measure income and substitution effect based on the compensated variation, uh, let's say approach. Uh, but what is nice is that uh, um, when changes are tiny, uh, they converge, uh, these two things converge to each other, right? So there's actually no, uh, when the things, the changes are not uh, uh, tiny, they, they might be different, but the, what is critical here is the idea. So when we consider a change from point zero to point one, right? we can break it down into two changes from point zero to point zero prime and then from point zero prime to point one, right? So when we uh, consider a change from point uh, zero prime to point one, it's kind of like just a rotation along the same budget line, right? Uh, due to what? Due to changes in prices. And this is called substitution effect, right? Change from point uh, zero prime to one is substitution. And change from point zero to point zero prime is obtained by just parallel shift of the budget line, which is income effect. Right, therefore, we can break down the change from our initial point to our uh, final point, right, from point zero to point one, into income and substitution effects, right? And what is critical, it is substitution effect that is uh, uh, that causes the distortions, right? Not income effect. So uh, it's because this kind of rotation alone of the budget line, uh, the substitution effect that we do have distortions in the system. Okay, so you will uh, work with income and substitution effect at your homework and so uh, you can use uh, that knowledge that you uh, learned during your microeconomics course so, and rely on the uh, compensating variation kind of graph to calculate it. Okay. And uh, we are we <laughs> over the time again? <laughs> Okay, guys, so let us just very quickly go through the idea of tax incidents. Tax incidents uh, study the effect of tax policy on prices. So how uh, an increase in the price would change the prices. Uh, what is important here? The settings as, as before, uh, good X and Y, good Y is numerator, good X is tax. But the difference now is that we have not a flat supply, but we have some supply curve that could have some positive slope. Uh, and then we need to distinguish between uh, 
the uh, pre-tax price or supplier price, supplier price and uh, uh, after-tax price or inclusive price, that is consumer price. And we denote this last thing by the letter Q. So here the graph that is uh, should be very familiar to you. So the demand curve D, the supply curve S, then we introduce tax on the consumer. So we shift the demand curve uh, down. So, so this is a red line. Then uh, the uh, 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 mm, equilibrium quantity goes down and uh, the producer prices uh, goes down and consumer prices goes up, right? They denote it by point D and C. So, but how we know how much would the uh, consumer price goes up and how much the uh, producer price goes down, right? So this is the question we are interested in. And to do that mathematically, uh, we need to start from equilibrium condition, demand equal to supply, but write it down for the uh, 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 new uh, after change situation, right? So, so we will uh, work with price P, which is a uh, uh, producer price, right? So then demand depend uh, on price P plus T. This is the uh, price that consumer pays, right? So this is the demand, the price, price P plus tax T, and it should be equal to the supply. Uh, so this equation, right, in general, define the uh, uh, equilibrium uh, price as function of tax rate T. So we can differentiate this uh, equation five to uh, obtain uh, the derivative of the price with respect to tax rate T. So this is given by formula six. So, uh, so it is equal to the derivative of demand with respect to price divided by the difference between the derivative of supply with respect to price minus the derivative of demand with respect to price. So uh, it's uh, usually more convenient to use this formula if we uh, rewrite it using elasticity. So for that, recall the elasticities of demand we already use it today, and elasticity of supply, uh, it's similar, right, so same, and then uh, just uh, 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 derive the, uh, the derivative of demand with respect to price from elasticity of demand, and derivative of supply with respect to price from the elasticity of supply, and plug in back into formula six and you will obtain incidence on producer. This is how much the uh, price would change as a result of introduction of uh, tax. But remember, this is like a uh, marginal uh, change, right? So small changes. And so we have that DPDT is equal to elasticity of demand divided by the difference between elasticity of supply minus elasticity of demand. But remember when you use this formula is that elasticity of demand is negative given my definition, right? Sometimes people use a, a definition just of absolute value. Here it is definition including the sign, right? So elasticity of demand is negative. So, and then we also can quickly calculate incidence on consumers. So it's uh, dqdt and it's simply dpdt plus one, right? Because q is equal to p plus t. And if you calculate it, it will be epsilon uh, elasticity of supply divided by elasticity of supply minus elasticity of demand. 
And then you can play with this formula to verify that when uh, uh, elasticity or we have uh, vertical demand, which is uh, perfectly elastic demand, uh, then all the burden uh, goes on the consumers. Right? Uh, from that. Sorry. Um, so, perfectly inelastic demand, right? What means that elasticity of demand is zero, and then uh, there's no incidence on the Uh, produce. Okay, so we have too little time, so think about that uh, at home. So this formula would be uh, helpful for you to understand uh, those graphs. So with that, let's finish. Um, okay. So we're done, guys. Thank you so much. Sorry again for taking uh more uh time and uh okay so uh if you have any questions so please write me or email me or ask me uh, okay with that uh bye bye okay thank you goodbye